Hello, today is September 29th, 2009. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig, and our cameraman today is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Maurice Rocket. Welcome, Maurice. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. May I ask you when and where you were born? May 22, 1921, Boston City Hospital, a bouncing baby boy, me. <laughs> and where do you currently live? What town do you currently Wayland. live in? Wayland, Mass. <clears throat> and your marital status? Married. Do you have children? Yes. How many? Three, three boys. Any grandchildren? Yes. How many? Four. <clears throat> Did you grow up in Boston? I grew up until the first grade, and because of bronchitis, the family doctor suggested we move to Sharon with the improved air, and it worked. And we resided in Sharon until we moved to Brockton, and I spent two years in Brockton, junior high school, and we returned to Sharon, where I finished school. And you graduated from high school in Sharon? Yes. What year did you graduate? 1939. What did you do after high school? Well, after high school, it was kind of a dull period because jobs just were not available. And I felt as though I needed some schooling, and uh, my quest was to go to New England Aircraft School. To do that, I needed a math course and a science course. So I went to Sharon as a postgraduate and took geometry, and I went to Lincoln Prep, which is a part of Northeastern, to take physics. And during that time, uh, I picked up some money by being a chauffeur for a gentleman who had a optician shop on Newbury Street in Boston. And how long did you do that? About a year. And then did you go to the aeronautics school? Yes, I did. And again, the name of it was Northeast? N no, New England. New England. Aircraft School. It doesn't exist anymore. And how long did you go to the aircraft school? Well, I only could afford a year. And something unusual on that, my friend and I would always dream about getting into the Naval Air Corps, and our, our, our hope for our destination would be Pearl Harbor. <laughs> Little did we know what Roosevelt was planning. <laughs> this was before anything happened. Yes. So you went for a year, mm -hmm. and then after that, did you enter the military? No. What did you do after that? I went down to Stratford, Connecticut, and worked at Chance Fort. And that area of Connecticut was booming in defense work. Chance Fort, Hamilton Standard Propeller, and Pratt and & Whitney. And there were people from all over the country working there. And I befriended some boys from Oklahoma, and we set up our own basketball team. So you were working for the company making propellers? No. Chance Fort made planes. They made planes, planes for aircraft carriers. Okay. And we used to wonder, where are they going to use them? There's no aircraft carriers in any naval pretense on the East Coast. It would have to be the West Coast. So what was going on out there? This was just general. We didn't spend much time thinking about it. But it was the chance I was making $50, $55 a week with some overtime. I bought a convertible with a rumble seat, and I shared an apartment. And I never had anything like that before, so I was in Fat City. You're fe feeling a bit of freedom? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you worked there for? About a year. A year. And then? Well, while we were there, my friend and I came back to Boston to take the Air Force cadet exam. He passed. I failed. I failed the physical part. And why was that? It was my eyesight. Mm -hmm. They didn't think it was up to what it should have been. So I went back to work again, and I detested factory work. So I went down to New York City, interviewed with the Clayton Knight Committee, and they were recruiting for the RCAF, the Royal Canadian Air Force. And the interview went very well, and the gentleman said, I suggest you call home now before I go any further to see if your parents will sign the papers that you're under 21. They said no. Your parents and, said no. And am I glad they said no, the way things turned out. 
So after that, did you consider joining military with I the I went US? back again to Boston, and I passed the exams, and I became an aviation cadet on April 29, 1942. Now, an aviation cadet is with the Army Air Corps? Yeah, the Army Air Force. It was no longer the Air Corps at that time. Army Air Force. Right. And in joining, did you join with other friends? Well, I took the exam with one friend. I don't know what I call that joining. We, we went in at different times. Mm -hmm. Why did you join at that time? Well, there was no future, and the service looked like a future, and the thought of flying uh, was certainly attractive, and uh, making money was uh, an inducement. So I would say those three things uh, were confronted me. It had nothing to do with, uh, you know, saving the world. Did you always have a fascination with flight? Yes. Mm -hmm. Even as a young boy? Yes. Yeah. Did anyone else in your family? No. <clears throat> And where were you sent for basic training? I didn't have any basic training. Mm -hmm. There was no such thing as basic training. Okay. The way you're thinking of right. it. Right. We went to Nashville, Tennessee, and we had a week of testing. And the purpose of testing was to try to eliminate people if possible, and then to ascertain would you be a bombardier, navigator, a pilot? How did things shape up? And my testing suggested I should go for bombardier school. And one thing while in Nashville, the first time I went to eat, you go down the line with this mess kit, and they kept flopping stuff on it. Well, I kind of gagged eating it, but at that, to, to clean the utensils, you had these big barrels of water, and you kept dipping in along the line, and they came scummy at the top. I said, that is, I never went back again. I ate at the BX, I had enough money on me, and I bought things at the BX. Because it just turned you off with yes. the way Yes, that was, was the end of Army food. Had you ever been outside of the uh, New England area before? No, that was the first time. So what was it like being in Tennessee? Terrible. Why? Red mud. I had a uh, floor assignment to try to scrub up. It was like, set like cement. And of course, the people spoke a funny language. But we With their not, accent, Yeah, you mean? I never got off the base. It was an intense week of testing. So once you were tested and bombardier was what you had your strengths in. That's what they said. How long did you stay in Tennessee? I was only there for a week. A week. I was then sent to Santa, Santa Ana, California for what they call pre-flight. And that pre-flight, people were segregated into the three areas of pilot, bombardier, and navigator. So all of the individuals with you were studying to be bombardiers at this point, training to be bombardiers. When you said they were segmented? Once I got the pre-flight, yes. Mm -hmm. And how long were you in pre-flight? I think it was three months, but the, at the end of the period of training, there was a notice on the squadron bulletin board. They wanted men to volunteer to become pilots to train RCAF primary school. Which again is that Canadian group that yes. your parents wouldn't let yes, you Yes, the do. Royal Canadian Air Force. I confronted for the second time. So I t left that and went into pilot free fright. Why, I don't know. There wasn't that much difference but I spent another period of time in that. Then I went to flight school in Tulare, California. So did you pass the pilot pre-flight Yeah, training? there was nothing to pass. It was just mm -hmm. ground school. So at this point, were you still thinking you were going to be a bombardier or you were going to be a pilot? No, I was hoping then I'd be a pilot. And what happened? I washed out. That means I flunked. In what way, what did you have to do to become a pilot that didn't happen? Was it... You mean before it, flying or after flying? It, you flunked out. What, what experiences... That means when, when I was training as a pilot, I didn't have the necessary moves or okay. reaction to things. And one of the strangest reactions was that if you're on a sled and you want to go left, you push right. You don't do that in the plane. If you want to go right, you push right. If you want to go left, you push left. So I screwed that up for a while. 
<laughs> and he said that was typical with people from, from New England. From New England. Yeah. <laughs> from sledding. So I fell right in the slot. <laughs> So you continued on then for bombardiering? Well, no, well then I was reviewed with the other people who washed out. And about a dozen who met the board, only three was sent back to pre-flight. Others were sent to gunnery school. So I went back to Santa Ana and went through pre-flight the third time. You think they would say, you've been here twice, that's enough, but no. Well, I can see it with the sequence of moving people. You didn't want to do one at a time. You wanted to do a few hundred at a time. Sure. So sure. I would throw everything out. So I started with a new class. And was it for bombardier? Yes. Mm -hmm. And one thing about um, Santa Ana, every Sunday they had these parades. I'll just take conjecture. It was 20,000 there. And you'd have to line up to go through this reviewing stand. And we kept coming in last, and there was one friend from North Carolina. And just before we got to the reviewing stand, he'd start a step, we'd throw the whole line out. So we always came in last. <laughs> we had night practice sessions and everything. The lieutenant who was in charge of the, uh, the squadron uh, just gave up on us. That, I thought that was fine. Then another thing was exercising continuously. And I didn't go for the, the grappling up to the top of the rope. So what I would do, I'd stand in line, and as people finished, and there was enough to get over, I'd meld over to that section. <laughs> and when the instructor would turn around, I'd move over to the finish line. Making the appearance that you had gone over? Yes. And you got away with that? Yeah. Had you been caught, what would have happened? Well, those people would throw you up based on nothing. Mm -hmm. And then during the exercise, there might have been a thousand in front of you. I always try to get in the back row and I just laid down on the ground and move my rear end now and then. <laughs> I didn't go through all the push-ups. <laughs> they finally caught under that and put instructors in the rear too. <laughs> I did some other things, but I'm not gonna tell you them all. <laughs> did you make friends there? Were you a, a core group of individuals where you made friends? I made friends at the time, but they would, didn't continue on because mm -hmm. you never stayed together. Mm -hmm. So after the third time in pre-flight training, what happened after that? I went that? to Bombers Deer School in Deming, New Mexico. And what was that experience like? Well, on the second day on the physical training, they had us run. And I think the elevation was about 5,000 feet. Well, I never did anything before at elevation. I thought my chest would explode. I thought the instructor made a terrible move in not uh, conditioning us before asking us to take a long run. Getting used to the climate yes, and the altitude. Yes. Practically everyone had a problem. Mm -hmm. Just had to drop out. When you say a long run, how long was it? Oh, the I think run? it was a mile. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a. So, along with running, were you learning specifics about bombardiering? Yes. And, and what were some of those? Well, when you first started out, you were in a large hangar. And you're on the facilities like a little moving cart up above with a bomb site. And they had a tractor moving on the floor, and you were supposed to follow that and then have the bomb hit the tractor. Well, one time I was focused on the wrong tractor. <laughs> it went into the wall. <laughs> that wasn't good. <laughs> so when you're focusing, are you looking? Into the bomb site, yes. Mm -hmm. And then subsequent to that, we got in, in the planes and bombed from altitude. And when you say bombing from altitude, you'd actually go up in a plane yes. with the pilot yes. and the navigator? No, it didn't even navigate because we know where we were. Okay. It so, made a big circle. And, and, and it was specific to get instruction in doing this in a plane? Right. And then the practice of doing it. Mm -hmm. Were there any close calls during practice? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can you want to tell us about some of well, them? One night, I uh, hit a church. Oh dear. Well, the bomb sites had like four lights made out of wood and they're built like a pyramid. And all the lights had been knocked out except one by cadets in front of me. So here was this church with only one light on and I thought it was the target. Did it wreck the church? I don't know. I really didn't care. I, I, that sounds negative, but I didn't think that much about it. Mm -hmm. No one come back to me and said, you know, you kill someone, you damage anything. So how long did you have to stay practicing in New Mexico? 
I think that was three months. Three months again. Yeah. Another thing that happened, when you dropped a bomb, there was a fellow student in back with a camera, and he had to take a picture of the drop where it landed. And this particular night, I didn't have the chute on, and I was laying over this hole, and we hit an air pocket, and I went up like that in the air. <laughs> I thought I was going to go right through the hole. <laughs> Did, were you injured? No, I just banged my forehead. Didn't get a concussion. I didn't, the camera didn't drop out either. I was lucky on that. Mm -hmm. So after New Mexico, what happened? Well, at the end of New Mexico, they wanted me to become a navigator bombardier and a B-25. But I felt as though with the three turns of pre-flight and bombardier school, I had enough schooling as such, so I turned it down. They sent me then to a phase training school for B-17s in Pio, Texas. It was called Rattlesnake Base. In Texas? Yes. And what was that like? What was Texas like? Oh. You're, you're, and why? Because it was so removed, just out of nowhere, <laughs> and dust blowing, tumbleweed. Another time, I took another instance where a bulletin camp, a notice on the bulletin board, they wanted recruits to volunteer to be on B-29s. So I signed up for that. And now, did they accept you? Yes. In, they took about a couple of hundred uh, bombardiers from different areas. So talk about, bef well, let me, before you go into uh, that, what is the difference, for those who may not know, between a B-17 and a B-29? Well, a B-29 is about as, twice as large. It, uh, it had its own air conditioning. We, and I mean, oxygen movement. You didn't have to wear a mask. It could fly two or three times further. It could fly higher and carry a much bigger bomb load. Okay. So go on. Okay. Well, in Piot, waiting for the train to go to uh, Denver, Colorado, everyone was standing up nowhere in the sun. In Texas? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I said, why this? And across the way, there was a series of stores, like a bar and a general store and a post office. So I said, I'm going to go over there and have a couple of beers, and I can see 50 miles away when the train would come. Why stand out there with all these clowns? So when the train came, I got up and walked over and got on. Well, as I found out later, when you got on, they took roll call. And I was calling a month later saying I was AWL because they had been looking for me for a month. When you were with them yes. all along. Yes, and the officer, the colonel, who was chastising me, had earlier called me in because I was wearing yellow stockings and a civilian belt. So <laughs> when I try to plead my case, you forget it. <laughs> were you a bit of a maverick? Yes. Now, the B-29 at that time, I think there might have been only two planes in existence. So I would have been early on if I had gone through to be on a B-29 crew. It was called Central Fire Control. I'd be on top of the plane controlling multiple guns. Whether it also was Sisters Bombardier, I can't tell you because I didn't go that far. But I would have been early on in the training of B-29s and they crashed all over the place. It's a very dangerous plane until they ironed out the kinks. So even though you volunteered for mm -hmm. it, what, what road did you take? Well, I spent a month in Laurie, in Laurie Field outside of Denver. Okay. So after that, they sent me back to Pio, and I was assigned to another crew. Did you know, did you hear while you were in all of this training what was going on overseas and... Not uh, the least of my concern. You really were so focused on what you no, were doing. We weren't reading newspapers, we weren't listen, listening to radios. Mm -hmm. And did you have any idea when you would be shipped out or sent no, out? or none. Okay. So well, how long... I knew before that, I, I knew that Germany had uh, invaded Poland. Mm -hmm. I knew that Germany had been heavily involved in Spain. I knew that the Chinese were brutalized by the Japs in Manchuria and Shanghai. And when I went down a couple of times to New York with a girl from Bridgeport, 
her relatives were from Czechoslovakia, and they were quite concerned because they were now captives of the Germans. So I had a pretty good background of what was going on. Mm -hmm. So then after getting back from Denver, back again to New Mexico, did you... No, back to Texas. Oh, Texas, I'm sorry. Did you continue training or...? Yes, I started up again the B-17 training with a crew of 10 people. So now you're, you're not just in bombardier school, now you're with your crew. You're right. all learning to work together. I'm involved. Okay. And what was a day like for all of you? Well, every day we'd go up as a crew and do different things in the plane. And you were the bombardier. Mm -hmm. There would have been a navigator. Yes. One there pilot. Were ten people, no, two pilots. Two pilots, uh, gunners. Well, I'll start in the front. It was a bombardier, navigator, two pilots, and behind him was what they call an engineer, and behind him was the radio man, two race gunners, a ball turret gunner, and a tail gunner, a complement pin. And was this the first time that all of you together had really met and mingled? Yes. Okay. What was, was it a, a camaraderie or did you have to Not work on that? Not in the beginning. That? Yeah. Because we're, we're totally different areas from the country and we had different mannerisms and speeches. And so it took a while to, to blend yeah. along with the technical aspects of what we were doing. So how long were you there for? Everything seems to be a month, putting it down for a month. Mm -hmm. Around a month. And then from Texas, where did you go? To Texas. I went to Delhart, which was advanced training in B-17s. So from 19, April, you said, of 42 that mm -hmm. you entered? Mm -hmm. um, when did you actually see some action? Well, we're a long ways to go yet. Okay. Right, so After we, that, I was sent to uh, outside of St. Louis, and we stayed there for a while until they decided what to do with us. And then we were sent to Camp Shanks, New York, and that was a departure place to go overseas. And I went overseas on a boat. I didn't fly over. Most of my friends flew over, and that took about five days. What was it like on a boat? Well, for the enlisted men, it was terrible because they slept in the desk and the stairway and everything. I had a, a compartment, and we were served meals, and this was the officer routine. So you were now an officer? Yes. What was your rank? I was rank? a second lieutenant then. And each day, the crew, the British crew, would go to the back of the ship and take these canisters and throw them out as if a submarine was coming at them. And uh, I said, <laughs> that didn't make me feel too good. He said, well, this would take care of a submarine. You know, we could outrun them. This was a passenger liner. Well, I said, we couldn't outrun a, a torpedo. <laughs> but I didn't sweat it out much. But if they hit the boat, there was no way, not enough life rights left or anything. They no didn't get hit, though, did they? No, I'm here. Mm -hmm. And we finished up at uh, Liverpool, England. So I about saw the five days. Rats I ever you saw in my life. I'm sorry. I saw the biggest rats I ever saw in my life. They looked like elephants, on the deck and the pier at uh, Liverpool. In Liverpool. Was there excitement, anxiety? How how were you feeling back then? How old were you? Twenty one. You were twenty one. Probably going to twenty two. Been twenty two at that point. And. What, do you remember what your feeling was like when you arrived? Well, the curiosity had said what it's going to be all about, because we had no concept of what combat was going to be, or what the elements of combat would be, the life on a base, because what we had done before didn't come close to what we were going to do. So what did happen? Well, we were sent to an area that were a few thousand airmen and we were all parcel out to different air bases. And I went to the 95th, and we ended up there one evening. It was wet, kind of snowy. And I said to myself, don't tell me they fly in this. <laughs> and they did. Yes, we did. 
Where was the 95th Air Base? It was a place called Horm. It was up between Norwich and Ipswich. It was below an area called the Wash, which separated England and Scotland. So was it north of Liverpool? It was not east of Liverpool. Okay. Liverpool was on the west shore. You were with your, I, I would naively call it a unit, but, but crew. crew. You were with your crew of 10, mm -hmm. and you're on this air base. Um, did they have you get acclimated to the base, or did they get you going right away? Well, there were so many losses from head-on attacks, my navigator and I were put on other crews for three missions. He got killed on his third, and I was lucky to survive. So then you had to get another navigator. Yes. Hmm. And that navigator had never worked in B-17s. He was flown straight over from navigation school to the base. <laughs> so he really started from scratch. But he worked in very well. So for the most part, did you stay with your crew other than those few Except times? Except for the pilot. Pilots changed? Well, the first pilot didn't work out that well. He lost his head on one mission, and my co-pilot and I went to the squadron leader and had him removed. And, and when you say he lost his head, it, was it, it that he had a breakdown? or Well, he wanted to transfer the fuel, what we call the Tokyo tanks, into the regular tank, and the person doing it didn't do it fast enough, and he went hyper over it. And we thought, when you're in combat, you're supposed to keep your cool and not let the others know that you're upset. Mm -hmm. And we didn't think we'd want to fly into more death-defying situations with him. So he was taken off, but he was shot down and became a POW. And unfortunately, he was Jewish and not treated too well. Really? But did he survive? Yes, he survived. So you got a new pilot, mm -hmm. and you got along well with him? Right. I flew with eight different pilots, so it wasn't that he was there forever. Was that unusual? Yes. Most of the people had a crew that stayed in its entirety from start to finish. As I said, I had eight pilots. But fortunately, each pilot came to us with a good reservoir of experience. They weren't trainees. A lot of them were, had their crew had probably been killed. Uh, that for some reason, they were bumped up to pilot from co-pilot, and they were given a crew. So we get an experienced pilot with an experienced crew. How often did you go out in flight? Well, I got hit in my 27th mission. So you did 27 missions before there was any issues, correct? Or did, had you gotten hit before that? Had me, me, my bo bodily harm? No, your plane. Oh, the plane was hit every time we went up. Every single time yeah. you went up. At this peri period, the attempt was to control the air for the invasion. So in doing that, you wanted to kill off as many German pilots and planes as you could. So we, I used this expression. We were suckered up to bring up the Germans, and we were ready to you know, give one for one. And we were sent to many missions way beyond our range, like to Poland three times, without any escort. So I figured there was something that didn't pass the smell test on that. But you couldn't do anything about it. So when, when you went up on a mission, you would leave from England and go mm -hmm. to different parts of Europe. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> how long, in a given day, how long were you up? Anywhere from five hours to 11 hours. Was that exhausting work for yes. you? Very tedious. And you said you got hit every time. The plane. The plane, yes. Sometimes badly. And during those times prior to the 27th mission, mm -hmm. we'll talk about that mm -hmm. in a moment, um, were there I injuries or death? Yes. Can you talk about any of that? Well, the, one of the waste gunners took a friendly fire, a 50 caliber, through his chest, and he just splattered all over the plane. And being a 21-year-old, which is pretty young, and, and for the most part, were most of your crew members around your age? Yeah. What was that like for you to see something like that? Well, it was the first time I'd seen anyone dead like that. It bothered me, but all the time during my tour, 
when people would get killed, it would be bothersome. But seconds later, I'd say to myself, I'm glad it wasn't me. And that's the way we uh, went through it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't wise to get too friendly with the men because it could be gone. And the quickest way to realize the adversity of the day was to come back and see empty beds. That was it. They were gone. So you knew because it was we empty. We wouldn't know then whether they were dead or POWs. No way to ascertain that mm -hmm. at the moment. And one way of, for instance, you mentioned earlier a pilot um, who, who was a POW. Would someone visually see that the pilot got out of the plane okay, but then was captured? Was that no. sometimes the case? No. no. When you were in combat under fire, the worst thing you could do would be stand there staring into space because the fighters could come at you so quickly, the closing speed, four or five or six hundred miles an hour. If you weren't ready, you were gone. So that not only, as you said earlier, thank God that wasn't me, mm -hmm. you also had to be alert and do your job yes. in order to survive. Yes. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the 27th mission. Well, let me, before we get to that. Sure. On a couple occasions, well, I had several head-on attacks, but twice the planes came in like that at me, and you could see the white puffs come all the way in. There was no question who he was shooting at. It was a case of who was going to, you know, go leave this world. The first one, he set his range so he was shot, so his bullets, shells didn't come all the way to the plane. The other one was too low, so they exploded under my turret, so I could feel them exploding, but they didn't hit me. Now, you're right in the front of the plane. Right. And I'm staring at a plane coming in, say, 600 miles an hour, and it's do or die. What was that but like I'm, for you? It wasn't necessarily skill. I was lucky. And I was surprised that I didn't freeze, but it was my life, you know, I was protecting. And I, I just amazed the way I hung in there. Now... What time of year is this? Winter? Oh, this is the winter. And what oh, we, was it like? We're missing a lot of things here. It was during the winter, and most of the time we couldn't see the target. So what does that mean to you? Anything? Well, you hope you have some sort of navigation. Well, they had what they call pathfinders, and they could pick up a river or a railroad or something like that. They couldn't pick up specific targets. So we were bombing downtown. So I was a people killer, and that didn't appeal, appear to me until about 50 years later, it dawned on me what I was doing. I was killing people. I probably never killed a German soldier. I just killed people, and it really bothered me. Later on. Yeah. Well, that isn't bad. The, the British were worse because their concept of bombing was to incinerate people. And all during the war, they kept looking for ways to improve ways to incinerate people. So when they talk about the Germans terror bombing, the Germans are nothing compared to the English in terror bombing. They were the masters of terror bombing. Did you... Well, let's get to some other things on flying. You weren't having them covered. But when you... In, were you appropriately clothed, I know? No. Was it very cold? No, it was probably 50 or 60 below. And we had electric suits. In the beginning, they were singularly wired. They came later parallel wired. So they diffused, what would you call it, burn. The current would work through and burn into the fabric of the suit. One time I got a serious burn, so I stopped plugging it in. So I, I, plus the fact, if you had to jump out quickly and it's plugged into the wall, that might be a deterrent factor in leaving. So I stopped using it. But frostbite was very prevalent among crews. And the other element was the oxygen mass would freeze up. You'd have to take it off and tap it to get the ice out so you could breathe. And oxia, uh, many people died from that, lack of oxygen. And those two elements there were worse than the, the, the Germans, our own equipment. And the people who led it couldn't care less. They were more concerned about the machines than the people. We were expendable. That doesn't sound too favorable, but that's really, that was the fact of life. We were expendable. 
Tell us about some of your other missions prior to the 27th mission and about your free time when you didn't free have Free time to I was sleeping or drinking. Mm -hmm. Was drinking prevalent <laughs> yes. in that generation? Yes. I know it was a generation, but you needed some way to pay back. So you went to the officer's club or went to a local pub and drinking seemed to be the natural outlet. Did you have a specific mechanics crew or did you have different ones all the time? Well, I flew so many different planes. Uh, a lot of people had a plane that had a name on it. Mm -hmm. Name meant nothing to me because I never flew in the same plane. Mm -hmm. Every pilot had their own plane. And you said you had eight different pilots. pilots yeah. Any one of them stick out more than the other? They were all good except one. The one I that a, you initiated? Yes, met. I had all experienced pilots. And during our time, as I said before, the initiative was to destroy as much of the Luftwaffe as we could. So that meant that we confronted a lot of Luftwaffe pilots. One mission, I would say, we confronted 200 fighters. And every time they come by, B-17s would be going down. And if someone was beside you that needed help, you could not leave formation. You just had to leave them there and planes would be exploding on fire, people were jumping. It was like a three-ring circus. At, not all the time, but our main problem was fighter attacks in my period. And I started December 43, my first mission. Did you have any kind of period of time during this time where you just didn't want to do it anymore? Mm -hmm. You knew you had you to mean do it. You quit? Well, maybe not go up this time. No. no. I would imagine there had been some ready for the funny farm, and they were just taken off the base. We would never know anything about it. Mm -hmm. Any close calls with that regard with any of your crew members? Close calls every time it went up? Every time. Along with being shot at, when we went from the ground to the altitude, we could go through 20,000 feet of clouds and not see anything. And every now and then you see a big flash. What would that mean? Two planes had collided. And when you get out of the clouds, there'd be groups like that going back and forth trying to find their formations. So there's a lot of ways to die other than flak. Or your plane, we were always overloaded. And in taking off, we didn't have enough power to get airborne, and you just crash on the ground. And that happened with some other crew? Oh, yeah. Oh, friendly fire was another place to die. And you mentioned that earlier, that yeah. someone had. Because if you're sitting there and you're tracking the fighter fast, you're tracking the fighter, you forget about there's a plane ne right next to you. You don't intend to do it. It just happens. There's bullets flying all over the place. So the 27th mission. That was not a good day. That was April 29th, the day that I went in, 44. And on that day, I was taken off my crew to fill in for a bombardier and a crew that for some reason he couldn't fly. He could have been sick or had a bad cold or whatever it was. But they were a green crew on their third mission. And every time they saw a fighter, it was 10 miles away, they would shoot at it. And they would hold it <laughs> too long on the trigger. And if you did that, you'd burn out the barrel. The barrel would just go like that, it would get overheat. So I yelled at them to stop it. And I thought the pilot would pick me up, but he didn't. He let these maroons keep doing it. So I just took off my info and put it down. I couldn't take it anymore. And what happened? Well, over the target, that day, we lost 64 bombers and 30, 13 fighters. That was quite a bit to go down. And I'll just let's say Logan Airport and see 64 passenger planes go down. So we lost an engine over the target, and we, lost, we had to leave formation. And there were bandits everywhere, which we called the Germans. And we headed towards Duma Lake, which was west of Berlin. And there was an anti-aircraft battery there, and I never got tracked before, by a, by a single battery. We go left, they go left. We go right, they go right. I said, this is it. We're not gonna make it. And a blast came in in the front, 
and blew out part of the nose. And the percussion, not percussion, percussion, spun me halfway around. So I was certain I had a headroom. And years ago in high school, one time waiting to get up a bat, someone let the bat go and smack you in the back of the head. Well, that's the way that percussion did. I felt like I had got a baseball bat. But I looked down and I could see the blood on my Mae West. Then I realized what happened. And a Mae West is? Well, Mae West is that garment you wore in case you had a bailout in the water. Mm -hmm. It's like water wings. Mm -hmm. So you look down and you see blood. Mm -hmm. And then do you start feeling around or what happened? Well, in turn, I went towards the guns because they were under attack. Then I realized I couldn't see. My vision just disappeared. So I went back and lay down on the floor. I, I was done. And fortunately, we caught up with some other planes, which were also crippled, to go back in formation. You needed the formation for protection. If you're out there by yourself, uh, you wouldn't make it. Did you know where your injury was? You said you couldn't see. I had no idea. Were others injured on the plane? No. Not Just to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. And no. this was a group, like you said, that you really didn't know. This was... I never saw them before mm -hmm. that morning. So you go back into formation, mm -hmm. and did they continue in combat at that oh, time? Oh, no. That, we were heading back heading to England. Heading back. Now, whether there was attacks after that, I don't know. I wasn't too concerned. Now, while you're laying on the floor, and you're, is anyone helping you? Well, the navigator wrapped a big bandage around my head. To, uh, it, it wasn't heavy bleeding. There was bleeding from the eye, and the plexiglass just shatters into small pieces, so I had little cuts all over my face. But you didn't know at that point in time how badly injured you no were. I had no were. idea. And when you got back to the base? I got to the base, they shot up a red flare. So they had the meat wagon or the ambulance ready when we hit the ground. And that's what they would do? They would shoot a flare, which would mean we have That injured. would give us priority for landing. OK. Right. And then they took me off the plane and put me in an ambulance and took me to the local, I call it, hospital or dispensary, McCure, Coleman, Aspirin. And they realized it was beyond their ability, so they took me to a field hospital. And where was the field hospital? In England? I don't. It was England, yeah. And did, did they operate or? Yes. And what was the injury? A piece of metal had pierced right through the center of my eye. Were you in pain or were you in shock? Well, I think you're kind of in shock that the pain wasn't an element. And was it your right eye? Yes. Mm -hmm. Could they save the eye? Well, they thought they could. You have to realize during the war that a lot of operations are surgical techniques that developed that are later used in civilian life. And they took my eye, he asked the surgeon, said, keep looking down so he could pull a flap of flesh over the wound part. And then he put the sutures in. So I had to be conscious all the time of looking down while he was sewing and cutting. Do you remember that? Yes. I remember the sutures on my cheek. Then after that, I was put in a room between two towel-wrapped cinder blocks. And I laid between those for about five days. Two cinder blocks? Mm -hmm. to so keep, I couldn't move my head. To keep your head keep from moving. keep the stitches in tow. Mm -hmm. in tow. And they did that because they didn't have the mechanisms that they would have today. Well, I don't know if they could do any better today. Mm -hmm. How long were you in the field hospital for? I would say for about a, everything is a month. <laughs> say a month. That was April, and I stayed there till July. And in fact, some of the infantrymen from the invasion came to our hospital. Did I you hear that. from your original crew while you were there? Just the navigator came over once. Mm -hmm. It would be difficult to get there, and they wouldn't know when they'd have to fly, so it just wasn't easy jumping in the cab and coming over. Did your family? And they, I couldn't go in the base because they didn't want walking wounded around. Sure, sure. <laughs> so that was, I, I thought I'd go back to the base and say hello to everyone. They said no. Morale-wise? Yeah, might... I could see that yeah, when yeah. I thought about it. How did your family find out? My family got the typical war notice. And, and would that aunt, have been a telegram or a letter? I guess a telegram or a letter. And my aunt said that when my father read it, he got in the car and drove all night. She thought he was suicidal. 
And there's an element there that I was going to bring up later on and bring up now. I never thought in terms of what the people at home were going through. I was oblivious to that. Whether that was, you know, the wrong thing on my part, I just didn't think that way. I was thinking of my own life and not the way someone else reacted to it. Well, I, do you feel it's also because <clears throat> they couldn't see you, you couldn't see them, you had to get well, and so that was your main concentration? Mm -hmm. It's a funny thing, just before I got hit, I had to pass to London, and I had a picture taken, and in the process of mailing it from London to Sharon, it got creased right through the right eye. Can you believe that? Isn't that interesting? Right through the right eye. Yeah. Of course, my parents couldn't deduce what it meant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So once you're in the field hospital, you have the surgery, how long did you have to keep the bandages on? Do you remember? I think they came out in about a week. We went into a dark room and just like in the movies, they took out the bandages and put on the flashlight. And <laughs> Could you see anything? Uh, in the left eye, I could see. In the right eye, I couldn't see anything. But I said, happy day, I could see. One eye was better than none. Because at that time, did they have both eyes bandaged? Oh, yeah. Okay. I thought there was a good chance I was blind. No one was telling me anything, because they probably didn't know for sure. Mm -hmm. Because glass got in the good eye, and that could have damaged it. Did you ever remember during that time having feelings of really low morale yourself? I can't, can't remember. Did you well, in the hospital, it got to me because you'd hear people screaming, moaning, the whole bit. <laughs> uh, that, that was upsetting. Were there nurses there to help oh, you? Oh, yes. Oh, the contingent of my hospital all came from Duke, the, the, uh, the surgeons and the, the nurses. So they came in as a skilled force. That was good. And they were really good? Yes. Good medical help? Yes, excellent. Mm -hmm. While you were there, did you hear anything more about what was going on elsewhere well, during the war? Well, I the Stars and Stripes. Mm -hmm. And as I said, the, some of the wounded from the invasion came in, and I helped uh, register them. And when you talk about the invasion, you mean the Normandy invasion? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were standing right there with all the wet and the sand on them. And the nurse came over and said, Rocket, they don't want to see you with that high badge. Get it back in the, back in the ward. Did you get to talk to a lot of them about their experiences? I didn't talk to any of them because mm -hmm. we were separated entirely. Mm -hmm. I did later on, but these were men from the infantry and the tank divisions. This was just one part of my hospitalization. And it continued after that? Oh, yes. Where? Well, before I get to that, mm -hmm. as I understand it, we were the second plane to come back with the wounded from the invasion. And I was the only Air Force person on it. And most of them were inside cots. They, they, they couldn't get around. So one of the infantrymen said, would you take me up front so I could see what the cockpit looked like? <laughs> so I took him up. And the pilot was asleep, and the co-pilot was reading a book. <laughs> and I think he probably figured they should be there steering the plane. He went pale. <laughs> and the, I thought that was so funny. And the plane was on automatic pilot? Yes. And we, well, we landed at Iceland and then Newfoundland. But that was the key. He never wanted to see that again. He figured they were driving up there <laughs> under full control. Now, when you would land in Iceland or Newfoundland, how long would you stay there for? Just to refuel. Mm -hmm. When we got to uh, Mitchell Field, all the reporters realizing of the neophytes coming in from combat were there to uh, interview them. And when I walked out and everyone else was carried out, they said, what's wrong with you? Well, my one-third English, Irish, and Scotch came out and I told them what I thought. Well, I got into a real argument with one reporter and a couple of MPs came up and I should me through a hanger to get away from it all. And where is Mitchell Field? Uh, New York. How, how soon did you get to Mitchell Field after your um, month or so at the field hospital? Did you go to another hospital before going to Mitchell Field? No. 
So this was this was the flight home from the sixty six hospital. Okay. So in fact, I flew home from Presbyterian Scotland, and would you believe it? As we were taking up, a plane crashed right in front of us. It was nearly <laughs> the end, right there, before I even got home. So, did you know you were being discharged at this point? No. Mm -hmm. There were ways to go for that. I so went to a place called Valley Forge in Pennsylvania. When you arrived in Mitchell Field, and you said you were walking off, did you have a patch on your yes. uh, right eye? Yes. But you could see with your left eye. Yeah. Did I you... was tearing a lot. In the left eye. Right. I couldn't take a glare like that for two or three years. Oh, from the lighting here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did you wear dark glasses? Yes. Uh -huh. Did your family know you were coming home? Yes. Uh, I can't answer that correctly. I'm not sure. I don't think they did. Once you arrived in Mitchell Field, how long did you stay there for? Maybe two or three days to get reassigned to a hospital. And at that time, could you get in touch with your family? Yes, I called home. What was that like, talking to your family? Strange. I didn't know what to say. <laughs> to, to try to tell them what happened, to tell them something to make feel good, or, or what? It was, I was lost. So I just, I said, as soon as I feel better, I'll get a hold of you again and we'll, we'll meet. And what hospital were you assigned? Valley Forge Hospital in, in Phoenix, Pennsylvania. And how long were you at Valley Forge? I got there, say, July 7th, and I was there until December. But now this hospital, that was the first time I really became cognizant of what combat was about because their specialization was eye work and plastic surgery. And there were people moving around in that hospital like there was hardly anything left of their body. It was just it was a horror story. And it took me days to adjust to it. I thought I was bad off, but I was well off compared to these men. The burn, the burns were terrible. So that didn't prepare you. I mean, no, I never. There were people probably in the air were getting killed and dying all around me. I but never saw them. Right. And we came landed, they were taken off. I never saw them. This is the first time I really confronted anything like that. And now you're with them yes, six now months them. out of the whole year. Yeah. Was that very traumatic for you? Was it what? Traumatic for yes. you? Were you able to talk to a doctor or anyone about that? Oh, not to the point you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It just was something that... Was it I one just, of those things that, again, you had to suck up, like you had mentioned yeah, earlier? Yeah. After a few days, I got used to it. While you were there, did family come to visit you? No, my uncle came. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that meeting? It was, he was there for one day. And we had a, a, an enjoyable, uh, positive meeting. And then was he... He seemed more concerned about the wound than I was at the time. Yeah. And were you down at that time? No. Mm -hmm. I thought I was doing pretty good. And did he go back home and report to your family about... Not at that point. No. So you were there... I'm not through yet. Go ahead. <laughs> because after Valley Forge, I was sent to... Carl Gables, Florida, the Biltmore Hotel. And why the Biltmore? Rest and Recuperation. R&R. And, &R. and the Biltmore Hotel was really something else. That's where they had the Olympics in the 30s. Was that enjoyable for you? Yes. And how long did you have there? Well, I would say three or four months. I ended up in Miami Beach, South Beach. And the weather was better, certainly, than in um, the yes. East Coast, uh, mm -hmm. Upper East Coast, right? What did you do during the day there? I'd Go swimming, frolic. Uh, so you relaxed? Baseball, oh, yes. Did you befriend people while you were there? Not too many. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one infantryman I did. Either he got hit a Nanzio and had terrible facial scarring. He lost an eye, too. So could you commiserate with him about that? Yeah. Well, I remember going to the officers' club, and a lot of the people had lost an eye. They would take out their glass eye and put it on the bar. <laughs> you see four or five glass eyes in a row. Now, did you have a glass eye? No, I decided to leave it in. Mm -hmm. And uh, after a period of time, it, the cataract became bad, and it became painful. In fact, it was on a trip to Switzerland. I said to my wife, I just can't take the pain of this anymore, so I had to take it out. 
You had the eye taken out. Yes. So you have a false eye now. Yes. You'd never know it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was how many years later? When I'll, say, we, I'll say 10 is a ballpark okay, figure. All right. So you had rest and relaxation at the Biltmore. During that time, were you under a doctor's care? We met with doctors, but not the same type of care that I had in the other hospitals. Were there doctors that also did sort of psychological studies on any of you? They had a small funny farm at um, Valley Forge. But those people were isolated completely, so I didn't know anything about what was going on. So you weren't involved in any no, of that at all? No. While you're r and ring rest and relaxation, as they say, in Florida, mm. were, was someone, Uncle Sam, making plans to eventually discharge you? I, I didn't get discharged. I got retired. Most of the people got discharged. I went before a retirement board and was fortunate enough to get retired. Why? What was the difference? I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I was just lucky. And was it down there that you did this? Yes. Uh -huh. Of course, when you get a retired, then you get a pen retirement pension, which would be much higher than a VA pension. And was it specifically because of your loss of sight, do you feel? Right. I think because of the nature of the loss, the 30% that they uh, accommodated me. Oh, when I drove down from Valley Forge to uh, Coral Gables, I was with the person from the infantry, and he had a bazooka gun, rifles, pistols, and he was loaded for bear. And all the way down, going through south, he didn't poop the window and shoot at the mailboxes. <laughs> he must have plugged a hundred mailboxes on the way down. <laughs> and you're driving? Well, we took turns driving. <laughs> You're lucky you weren't arrested. <laughs> if it happened in current day, you probably would be. Yeah. Yeah. We, we thought it was a jolly at the time. Well, another thing I forgot to tell you, that my first crew in Piot, that the FBI came up one day to the pile and said, we're picking up your tail gunner because he was using marijuana. And I didn't know what the term marijuana meant at all. So we had someone back there staring into space while we're trying to fly. I thank heavens he didn't go into combat with us. So he was taken off the crow. I forgot that early on. So that was a long time ago. Yes. I, I've never heard any of the other interviews we've done. I've never heard of marijuana being brought up during uh, yeah. World War II. I never II. knew what marijuana was. Interesting. So he was arrested right then and there? Yes, he was taken away and put in jail. How do you think they found out? I don't know how they found out. Whether someone tattled on them or could be a crew member who was cleaning up the plane and saw the, uh, the uh, stuff around. I don't know. So once, when you went on R&R, &R, we have that. Do you feel that um, you were properly trained leading up to your injury, but properly? Properly trained and equipped for the combat well, that you faced? Properly trained, but not properly equipped. The, uh, the, the, we had no head covering either. I used the uh, GI helmet. In fact, I used that for my party, too. Oh, one time, I had to do number two. <laughs> and the navigator said, Rocky, I can't take that smell anymore. So I went back to this exit point of the plane and dropped it. And almost instantaneously, someone said, what was that? Well, it smacked into the back of the ball turret, and it froze right on there. It's a good thing it didn't hit the front of the turret, or he would have been blinded for the rest of the mission. <laughs> <laughs> there was no laboratory in the plane. They had these little tubes you could use, but they would freeze up, so if you used it, all, all the urine would come back on you. So it was a nightmare. Do you think your weapons were equal to or better than or inferior well, to the enemy? I thought the 50 enemy? caliber gun was an excellent uh, Let me say, I thought the German Luftwaffe was outstanding. Every time I'd come back, you'd read in the Stars and Stripes how many planes we shot down. Well, divide those numbers by two or three, because when I looked out the window, there was just as many of our planes going down as theirs. Mm -hmm. And the Germans had a poor grade of petroleum. And when they took a dive, gunned it, if I may use that expression, 
black exhaust would come out. Well, our gunners would construe that, that they'd hit the plane, and it wasn't a kill at all. So that gave fictitious figures. So you were in Florida when you were retired? Retired, yes. And what was your rank at that point? First lieutenant. Oh, had I stayed on and not been hit, I had the choice of going to London to um, intelligence school or becoming squadron navigator. But my bombardier, sorry about that. Well, I certainly would have gone to London because <laughs> let the good times roll. You had a good but time there. But I didn't there. get the, the opportunity. And then I would have got promoted to captain. Mm -hmm. But that didn't happen. Any regrets about that? Well, I wished I loved to have gone to London, yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, one time in London, <laughs> I was feeling pretty good, and we were right across the street from Hyde Park where they had NA aircraft batteries, and it almost lifted you out of bed, the per percussion of the thing. Well, I was feeling pretty good, so my friend got up, he said, what do you think we should do? I said, should we go into the, uh, the underground and, and take refuge? I said, no, I'm going to stay in bed. So I stayed in bed all during the bombing. Nobody came and got you out? Every Sometime. Why would you come to get me out? Why well, take risk your life to get me? <clears throat> if I was foolish, foolish enough to stay there. So what were some of your commendations that you received? It was a Purple Heart in the air mill with clusters, which included the clusters for the downing of the planes, uh, the Distinguished Flying Cross, then there's the typical things of European theater, theater, American theater, victory medal, but those were just ribbons. What was, your f what was it like for you? When you were retired, did you make plans to come back to Sharon? Is that where your family was still? I, well, no. I didn't want to stay in Sharon because I went to the GI Bill, and I wasn't really in the GI Bill. But people who had a loss ratio of 30% or more, it was like public love 15, I could have gone to school for 10 years if I wanted to, and I get a higher monthly amount. So my first choice was Southern Cal. But so many people were trying to matriculate from California, they couldn't guarantee admission. So Texas took me right away. So I went to the University of Texas in Austin. And I thought Austin was the nicest place I ever lived. Did you come home to Massachusetts at all before that? Yes. What was it like? What were you feeling like when you were coming home? The place didn't appeal to me anymore. Were you anxious about seeing your family? Yes, I just felt everything was going to look at my eye. I, and I didn't want to get into a constant explanation of what happened. You didn't want to talk about no. it? No. Well, I didn't mind talking about it, but I didn't want to go through the thing, the exercise over and over again. I didn't think it was something to brag about. So you talk, discussed somewhat with your family, but you wanted to move on, so to speak? Well, I didn't want to stay in New England. I wanted to go elsewhere because I'd seen other parts of the country that appeal to me. So having gone to Texas and California, those places appealed to you? Yes. <clears throat> so how soon after did you go to Texas? From the time I got out of the service? Oh, I would say it was about three months. Did you join any unit of the military reserve? No. I didn't want to play checkers once a month to be a lieutenant colonel. Did you join any veterans no. organizations? But you did say you received some um, GI Bill yes. and medical and things of that nature. I never used uh, medical assistance under the GI Bill, or that it be through the VA. I had nothing to do with the VA. Why? Because I didn't need them. So you joined the University of Texas, mm -hmm. and how did you go there for four years? I got the BBA and MBA. There was an intervention at the University of Maryland for a summer term, but I came back to Texas. And did you... <clears throat> Was the rest of your adult life or a lot of your adult life in that area, or did you eventually come back to? I eventually came back to New England, yes. Mm -hmm. 
I felt as though after being away from home for seven years, and my parents were getting, you know, along in years, that I should be in their presence. I just, at that, that point, I felt guilty for being away from home for so long. So seven years, including your service time and your School, schooling. Yes. And during that time, did you get married? No. You were still single? No, I uh, never went steady. <laughs> never met steady until I met my wife. I always had friends. So after seven years, you came back to New England. Well, let me tell you something about school. Mm -hmm. I took five years of college and three years and nine months. Wow, so that was a heavy load. I took extra courses and I went to summer school. I never stopped. Do you feel you were driven to do this, to get it over with? Or? Yes, I, I was getting along in years. I had a confront. Being the service wasn't the real world, being in school wasn't the real world. So I felt as though I had to come out and join the civilian world. So once you got your master's, what did you do? It was like a depression around here. I should have stayed in Texas because it was, was booming down there, absolutely booming. But it was deadly around here. Jobs are very difficult to find. So that would have been what, around 1950 or thereabouts? Yeah, 1950. I graduated in 48, then 49. And so what did you do? Well, I kind of goofed off for a while because I had no problem with money. But I had no problem with money in the school because I had the uh, retirement pay, I had the, uh, the government pay, and then I had made money uh, grading papers being a teacher's assistant. So I had three incomes. And you were a bit older than a lot of your classmates? I would say so. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, yes, the, the kids coming as freshmen then looked like they were sucking lollipops. <laughs> And what, what was your business career? <clears throat> what did you do? Well, my first job was working at a place where my wife worked. It was a steel company. And where was that? What that state? That was in Cambridge. Cambridge, Mass. Okay. Yes. And then I went from there to Liberty Mutual. I stayed there for 30 years. And were you an agent or? No, I worked in... Uh, Underwriting, production, at the end, I had a small crew, and we made up what I would call today software, working with other different departments that bring things together. Did you meet your wife at the factory? Yes. Mm -hmm. well, it wasn't a factory. It was a, where they were. They didn't make things. They more or less were agents for, for steel products. Okay. Have you attended any reunions of your old crew or outfit? In college? No, I'm sorry, oh. uh, service. I went three or four times, and I was only interested in my own crew. When they died off, I lost interest. And so many times, they'd get up and tell these stories over and over again. Many times, things that never happened, I happened that way. I couldn't take it anymore. So you didn't? I just no. forgot it. How important to you was serving in the military? Well, it brought me into things I never had done. It gave me a chance for leadership, uh, responsibility, um, working with others. I never had that type of environment before, so it was a big help later on. Do you feel in any way that it affected your life? No. Go back a little bit. <clears throat> you had mentioned earlier in this interview that it really didn't bother you until 50 years later about I mean, killing people. Because killing people. Yeah. I didn't realize what I had done. Mm -hmm. I didn't think about it that way. I was just trying to protect my own ASS. I wasn't worried about other people mm -hmm. on the ground or in the air. Now, why do you think, though, it took you 50 years? I don't know. And in that time, was it so bothersome that you had to seek help, or did you mm -hmm. deal with it yourself? Well, I think that you set some kind of a mental block that you don't want to be dreaming, thinking about it all the time. Mm -hmm. so I just blocked it out. But I never, never had a dream about combat. I never had bad feelings about combat. Never. Where well, a lot of my friends were just the reverse. Mm -hmm. So um, I was lucky. Looking back at your career, 
Was there a memorable person or character or experience? That My crew. Your crew. I don't think I ever had a friendship like that, a brotherhood in my life, either before or after. Because we were there in, through life and death, you know, the, each one was involved with the other. And we, we never got to the point where we had to put our life on the line, and you don't know what's going to happen. When that event comes up, either you do or you don't. You don't sit there and decide, it, you either act or you don't act. Mm -hmm. It's that instantaneous. So you all had to trust each other. Yes. One for all, all for one. Above all, is there a thought or incident you'd like to share with your family or others that'll see this tape? Well, my first mission was quite unusual. I was taken up off my crew to fill in. And we went to Kiel, Germany, which was a sub-base. And why we bombed sub-bases, I don't know, because the, the sub-walls were so thick they just bounced off. But anyhow, we lost an engine over the target, and we had to leave formation. And in heading home, we lost another engine. And the pilot said, we were consuming so much gasoline with the two engines, more than four, we'll have to eliminate the weight. So we took all the guns and all the ammunition and threw it out. Well, I would say within two minutes after that, we were jumped by a German fighter on a tail attack. So we dove off into the clouds and came out over the North Sea. This is just after Denmark. And we were about three or 4,000 feet over the North Sea. This is in December. It's cold. If you think it was bad in New Jersey, to what they did, the question is now, are we going to have to ditch in the North Sea? And who's going to pick us up, the Germans or the English? So we were ordered to go back in the radio room. We all sat there with back against the firewall in case we had a crash into the water. Because we've never done that before. How is the plane going to hold up? Is it going to sink right away? Are we going to be killed in the crash? But we were lucky. We had enough gasoline, that's the last drop, to make it back to England. What was it like for you sitting there, as you said, leaning against the wall, your very first mission? Did you think, oh my God, first mission, I'm a goner? I have no idea. You don't remember? I don't remember. Were you I fearful? I think I'm probably more concerned about getting ready for when we hit the water, mm -hmm. what to do. Mm -hmm. You'd be overwhelmed with that thought. Always planning ahead. Yeah, you had to. Yeah. And so you, you were able to get back to England. Were you able to land on a base or in a yes, field? Yes, we were able to make the base and the plane held up. How bad the plane was damaged, I don't know. I never, after a mission, I never went around to check. People would go and count the holes. I could care less. I survived that satisfied Brother Rocket. Move on. Right. Yeah. Is there anything that uh, we haven't asked or any additional comments you'd like to bring up right now as we finish up this? Well, there was something unusual at Valley Forge. I had been in Philadelphia, and obviously we were having a good time, and I came back, and I slept late. So in the morning, the head nurse came by, everyone else was up, kept yelling at me, Rocket, get up, get up. Well, I wouldn't get up. So they pushed me out to a porch, and this is in the winter, all right? And I had a sheet, they took all the blankets away from me, so I only had a sheet on. So I had to give in, right? <laughs> well, I don't, I'm not, I don't wear an attire when I go to bed. I can't stand pajamas. <laughs> so I walked back to the library, into the ward with the sheet around me. In the meantime, people are starting to collect. <laughs> well, I had to get from the sheet to my bed to get dressed. <laughs> so I just dropped the sheet, walked over, and got dressed to a standing ovation. <laughs> <laughs> so throughout all of this, you had a sense of humor. Well, I think you had a... <laughs> Do you think that helped you survive through yes, everything that you'd yes, been through? Yes, and just not live with everything, you know, let it go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Maurice Rocket, we want to thank you for not only an entertaining remembrance, but also an amazing story. Um, we appreciate what you've done for us. And well, I enjoyed telling you. Thank you and so I'm much for being coming here today, too. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.